above a little puff of cloud whirled like dispersing smoke and the three or four people on the beach were peering up with interrogative faces towards the point of that unexpected report and that was all boots and waiters and the four young men in blazers came rushing out behind me shouts came from windows and doors and all sorts of worrying people came into sight agape for a time I stood there, too overwhelmed by this new development to think of the people. At first I was too stunned to see the thing as any definite disaster. I was just stunned, as a man is by some accidental violent blow. It is only afterwards he begins to appreciate his specific injury. Good Lord! I felt as though somebody was pouring funk out of a can down the back of my neck. My legs became feeble. I had got the first intimation of what the disaster meant for me. There was that confounded boy, sky high. I was utterly left. There was the gold in the coffee room, my only possession on earth. How would it all work out? The general effect was of a gigantic, unmanageable confusion. I say said the voice of the little man behind. I say, you know. I wheeled about, and there were twenty or thirty people, a sort of irregular investment of people, all bombarding me with dumb interrogation, with infinite doubt and suspicion. I felt the compulsion of their eyes intolerably. I groaned aloud. I can't, I shouted. I tell you I can't. I'm not equal to it. You must puzzle and... and be damned to you." I gesticulated convulsively. He receded a step as though I had threatened him. I made a bolt through them into the hotel. I charged back into the coffee-room, rang the bell furiously. I gripped the waiter as he entered. "'Do you hear?' I shouted. "'Get help and carry these bars up to my room right away.' He failed to understand me, and I shouted and raved at him. A scared-looking little old man in a green apron appeared, and further two of the young men in flannels. I made a dash at them and commandeered their services. As soon as the gold was in my room I felt free to quarrel. "'Now get out!' I shouted. "'All of you get out if you don't want to see a man go mad before your eyes.' and I helped the waiter by the shoulder as he hesitated in the doorway, and then, as soon as I had the door locked on them all, I tore off the little man's clothes again, shied them right and left, and got into bed forthwith. And there I lay swearing and panting and cooling for a very long time. At last I was calm enough to get out of bed, and ring up the round-eyed waiter for a flannel nightshirt, a soda and whiskey, and some good cigars. And these things being procured me, after an exasperating delay that drove me several times to the bell, I locked the door again, and proceeded very deliberately to look the entire situation in the face. The net result of the great experiment presented itself as an absolute failure. It was a rout, and I was the sole survivor. It was an absolute collapse and this was the final disaster. There was nothing for it but to save myself, and as much as I could in the way of prospects from our debacle. At one fatal crowning blow all my vague resolutions of return and recovery had vanished. My intention of going back to the moon, of getting a sphere full of gold, and afterwards of having a fragment of Cavorite analyzed and so recovering the great secret, perhaps finally even of recovering Cavour's body. All these ideas vanished altogether. I was the sole survivor, and that was all. I think that going to bed was one of the luckiest ideas I have ever had in an emergency. I really believe I should either have got loose-headed or done some indiscreet thing. But there, locked in and secure from all interruptions, I could think out the position and all its bearings, and make my arrangements at leisure. Of course, it was quite clear to me what had happened to the boy. He had crawled into the sphere, 
meddled with the studs, shut the cabarite windows, and gone up. It was highly improbable he had screwed the manhole stopper, and even if he had, the chances were a thousand to one against his getting back. It was fairly evident that he would gravitate with my bales to somewhere near the middle of the sphere and remain there, and so cease to be a legitimate terrestrial interest, however remarkable he might seem to the inhabitants of some remote quarter of space. I very speedily convinced myself on that point and as for any responsibility I might have in the matter, the more I reflected upon that, the clearer it became that if only I kept quiet about things, I need not trouble myself about that. If I was faced by sorrowing parents demanding their lost boy, I had merely to demand my lost sphere, or ask them what they meant. At first I had had a vision of weeping parents and guardians, and all sorts of complications but now I saw that I simply had to keep my mouth shut, and nothing in that way could arise. And indeed, the more I lay and smoked and thought, the more evident became the wisdom of impenetrability. It is within the right of every British citizen, provided he does not commit damage nor indecorum, to appear suddenly wherever he pleases, and as ragged and filthy as he pleases, and with whatever account of virgin gold he sees fit to encumber himself, and no one has any right at all to hinder and detain him in this procedure. I formulated that at last to myself, and repeated it over as a sort of private magna charta of my liberty. Once I had put that issue on one side, I could take up and consider in an equable manner certain considerations I had scarcely dared to think of before namely, those arising out of the circumstances of my bankruptcy. But now, looking at this matter calmly and at leisure, I could see that if only I suppressed my identity by a temporary assumption of some less well-known name, and if I retained the two months' beard that had grown upon me, the risk of any annoyance from the spiteful creditor to whom I had already alluded became very small indeed from that to a definite course of rational worldly action was plain sailing. It was all amazingly petty, no doubt, but what was there remaining for me to do? Whatever I did I was resolved that I would keep myself level and right side up. I ordered up writing materials, and addressed a letter to the new Romney Bank, the nearest, the waiter informed me, telling the manager I wished to open an account with him and requesting him to send two trustworthy persons, properly authenticated, in a cab with a good horse, to fetch some hundredweight of gold with which I happened to be encumbered. I signed the letter Blake, which seemed to me to be a thoroughly respectable sort of name. This done, I got a Folkestone blue book, picked out an outfitter, and asked him to send a cutter to measure me for a dark tweed suit ordering at the same time a valise, dressing-bag, brown boots, shirts, hat to fit, and so forth, and from a watchmaker I also ordered a watch. And these letters being dispatched, I had up as good as lunch as the hotel could give, and then lay smoking a cigar, as calm and ordinary as possible, until in accordance with my instructions two duly authenticated clerks came from the bank and weighed and took away my gold, after which I pulled the clothes over my ears in order to drown any knocking, and went very comfortably to sleep. I went to sleep. No doubt it was a prosaic thing for the first man back from the moon to do, and I can imagine that the young and imaginative reader will find my behavior disappointing. But I was horribly fatigued and bothered, and, confound it, what else was there to do? There certainly was not the remotest chance of my being believed, if I had told my story then, and it would certainly have subjected me to intolerable annoyances. I went to sleep. When at last I woke up again I was ready to face the world as I have always been accustomed to face it, since I came to years of discretion. And so I got away to Italy, and there it is I am writing this story. If the world will not have it as fact, then the world may take it as fiction. It is no concern of mine. 
and now that the account is finished, I am amazed to think how completely this adventure is gone and done with. Everybody believes that Cavour was a not very brilliant scientific experimenter who blew up his house and himself at Limpney, and they explain the bang that followed my arrival at Littlestone by a reference to the experiments with explosives that are going on continually at the government establishment of Lyd, two miles away. I must confess that hitherto I have not acknowledged my share in the disappearance of Master Tommy Simmons, which was that little boy's name. That, perhaps, may prove a difficult item of corroboration to explain away. They account for my appearance in rags with two bars of indisputable gold upon the little stone beach, in various ingenious ways. It doesn't worry me what they think of me. They say I have strung all these things together to avoid being questioned too closely as to the source of my wealth. I would like to see the man who could invent a story that would hold together like this one. Well, they must take it as fiction. There it is. I have told my story, and now I suppose I have to take up the worries of this terrestrial life again. Even if one has been to the moon, one has still to earn a living. So I am working here at Amalfi, on the scenario of that play I sketched before Cavour came walking into my world, and I am trying to piece my life together as it was before ever I saw him. I must confess that I find it hard to keep my mind on the play when the moonshine comes into my room. It is full moon here, and last night I was out on the pergola for hours, staring away at the shining blankness that hides so much. Imagine it! tables and chairs, and trestles and bars of gold. Confound it! If only one could hit on that cavorite again. But a thing like that doesn't come twice in a life. Here I am, a little better off than I was at Limpney, and that is all. And Cavour has committed suicide in a more elaborate way than any human being ever did before. So the story closes as finally and completely as a dream. It fits in so little with all the other things of life, so much of it is so utterly remote from all human experience, the leaping, the eating, the breathing, and these weightless times, that indeed there are moments when, in spite of my moon gold, I do more than half believe myself that the whole thing was a dream. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Two of The First Men in the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The First Men in the Moon by H. G. Wells. Chapter Twenty Two The Astonishing Communication of Mr. Julius Wendigee. When I had finished my account of my return to the earth at Littlestone, I wrote THE END, made a flourish, and threw my pen aside, fully believing that the whole story of the first men in the moon was done. Not only had I done this, but I had placed my manuscript in the hands of a literary agent, had permitted it to be sold, had seen the greater portion of it appear in the Strand magazine, and was setting to work again upon the scenario of the play I had commenced at Limpney before I realized that the end was not yet. And then, following me from Amalfi to Algiers, there reached me, it is now about six months ago, one of the most astounding communications I have ever been fated to receive. Briefly, it informed me that Mr. Julius Wendigee, a Dutch electrician, who has been experimenting with certain apparatus akin to the apparatus used by Mr. Tesla in America, in the hope of discovering some method of communication with Mars, was receiving day by day a curiously fragmentary message in English, which was indisputably emanating from Mr. Cavour in the moon. At first I thought the thing was an elaborate, practical joke by one who had seen the manuscript of my narrative, 
I answered Mr. Wendigee jestingly, but he replied in a manner that put such suspicion altogether aside, and in a state of inconceivable excitement I hurried from Algiers to the little observatory upon the Monte Rosa in which he was working. In the presence of his record and his appliances, and above all of the messages from Cavour that were coming to hand, my lingering doubts vanished. I decided at once to accept a proposal he made to me to remain with him, assisting him to take down the record from day to day, and endeavouring with him to send a message back to the moon. Cavour, we learnt, was not only alive, but free, in the midst of an almost inconceivable community of these ant-like beings, these ant-men, in the blue darkness of the lunar caves. He was lamed, it seemed, but otherwise in quite good health, in better health, he distinctly said, than he usually enjoyed on earth. He had had a fever, but it had left no bad effects. But curiously enough he seemed to be laboring under a conviction that I was either dead in the moon crater, or lost in the deep of space. His message began to be received by Mr. Wendigee when that gentleman was engaged in quite a different investigation. The reader will no doubt recall the little excitement that began the century, arising out of an announcement by Mr. Nikola Tesla, the American electrical celebrity, that he had received a message from Mars. His announcement renewed attention to the fact that had long been familiar to scientific people, namely, that from some unknown source in space, waves of electromagnetic disturbance, entirely similar to those used by Signor Marconi for his wireless telegraphy, are constantly reaching the earth. Besides Tesla, quite a number of other observers have been engaged in perfecting apparatus for receiving and recording these vibrations, though few would go so far to consider them actual messages from some extraterrestrial sender. Among that few, however, we must certainly count Mr. Wendigee. Ever since 1898 he had devoted himself almost entirely to the subject, and being a man of ample means, he had erected an observatory on the flanks of Monte Rosa, in a position singularly adapted in every way for such observations. My scientific attainments, I must admit, are not great, but so far as they enable me to judge, Mr. Wendigee's contrivances for detecting and recording any disturbances in the electromagnetic conditions of space are singularly original and ingenious and by a happy combination of circumstances they were set up and in operation about two months before Cavour made his first attempt to call up the earth. Consequently we have fragments of his communication even from the beginning. Unhappily, they are only fragments, and the most momentous of all the things that he had to tell humanity, the instructions, that is, for the making of Cavorite, if indeed he ever transmitted them, have throbbed themselves away unrecorded into space. We never succeeded in getting a response back to Cavour. He was unable to tell, therefore, what we had received or what we had missed. Nor, indeed, did he certainly know that any one on earth was really aware of his efforts to reach us. And the persistence he displayed in sending eighteen long descriptions of lunar affairs as they would be if we had them complete, shows how much his mind must have turned back towards his native planet since he left it two years ago. You can imagine how amazed Mr. Wendigee must have been when he discovered his record of electromagnetic disturbances interlaced by Cavour's straightforward English. Mr. Wendigee knew nothing of our wild journey moonward, and suddenly this English out of the void— it is well the reader should understand the conditions under which it would seem these messages were sent. Somewhere within the moon Cavour certainly had access for a time to a considerable amount of electrical apparatus, and it would seem he rigged up, perhaps furtively, a transmitting arrangement of the Marconi type. This he was able to operate at irregular intervals, sometimes for only half an hour or so, 
sometimes for three or four hours at a stretch. At these times he transmitted his earthward message, regardless of the fact that the relative position of the moon and points upon the earth's surface is constantly altering. As a consequence of this, and of the necessary imperfections of our recording instruments, his communication comes and goes in our records in an extremely fitful manner. It becomes blurred. It fades out in a mysterious and altogether exasperating way. And added to this is the fact that he was not an expert operator. He had partly forgotten, or never completely mastered, the code in general use and as he became fatigued he dropped words and misspelt in a curious manner. Altogether we have probably lost quite half of the communications he made, and much we have is damaged, broken, and partly effaced. In the abstract that follows, the reader must be prepared, therefore, for a considerable amount of break, hiatus, and change of topic. Mr. Wendigee and I are collaborating in a complete and annotated edition of the Cavour record, which we hope to publish, together with a detailed account of the instruments employed, beginning with the first volume in January next. That will be the full and scientific report, of which this is only the popular transcript. But here we give at least sufficient to complete the story I have told and to give the broad outlines of the state of that other world so near, so akin, and yet so dissimilar to our own. End of chapter Chapter 23 of The First Men in the Moon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The First Men in the Moon by H. G. Wells Chapter 23 An Abstract of the Six Messages First Received from Mr. Cavour The two earlier messages of Mr. Cavour may very well be reserved for that larger volume. They simply tell, with greater brevity and with a difference in several details that is interesting, but not of any vital importance, the bare facts of the making of the sphere and our departure from the world. Throughout, Cavour speaks of me as a man who is dead, but with a curious change of temper as he approaches our landing on the moon. Poor Bedford! he says of me, and this poor young man, and he blames himself for inducing a young man, by no means well equipped for such adventures, to leave a planet on which he was indisputably fitted to succeed, on so precarious a mission. I think he underrates the part my energy and practical capacity played in bringing about the realization of his theoretical sphere. We arrived, he says, with no more account of our passage through space than if we had made a journey of common occurrence in a railway train. And then he becomes increasingly unfair to me, unfair indeed to an extent I should not have expected in a man trained in the search for truth. Looking back over my previously written account of these things, I must insist that I have been altogether juster to Cavour than he has been to me. I have extenuated little and suppressed nothing, but his account is, It speedily became apparent that the entire strangeness of our circumstances and surroundings, great loss of weight, attenuated but highly oxygenated air, consequent exaggeration of the results of muscular effort, rapid development of weird plants from obscure spores, lurid sky, was exciting my companion unduly. On the moon his character seemed to deteriorate. He became impulsive, rash, and quarrelsome. In a little while his folly in devouring some gigantic vesicles and his consequent intoxication led to our capture by the Selenites, before we had had the slightest opportunity of properly observing their ways. He says, you observe, nothing of his own concession to these same 
vesicles. And he goes on from that point to say that we came to a difficult passage with them, and Bedford mistaking certain gestures of theirs, pretty gestures they were, gave way to a panic violence. He ran amuck, killed three, and perforce I had to flee with him after the outrage. Subsequently we fought with a number who endeavoured to bar our way, and slew seven or eight more. It says much for the tolerance of these beings that on my recapture I was not instantly slain. We made our way to the exterior, and separated in the crater of our arrival, to increase our chances of recovering our sphere. But presently I came upon a body of Selenites, led by two who were curiously different, even in form, from any of these we had seen hitherto, with larger heads and smaller bodies, and much more elaborately wrapped about. And after evading them for some time, I fell into a crevasse, cut my head rather badly, and displaced my patella, and finding crawling very painful, decided to surrender, if they would still permit me to do so. This they did, and perceiving my helpless condition, carried me with them again into the moon. And of Bedford I have heard or seen nothing more, no, nor so far as I can gather, any Selenite. Either the night overtook him in the crater, or else, which is more probable, he found the sphere, and desiring to steal a march upon me, made off with it, only, I fear, to find it uncontrollable, and to meet a more lingering fate in outer space. And with that Cavour dismisses me and goes on to more interesting topics. I dislike the idea of seeming to use my position as his editor to deflect his story in my own interest, but I am obliged to protest here against the turn he gives these occurrences. He said nothing about that gasping message on the blood-stained paper in which he told, or attempted to tell, a very different story. The dignified self-surrender is an altogether new view of the affair that has come to him, I must insist since he began to feel secure among the lunar people. And as for the stealing a march conception, I am quite willing to let the reader decide between us on what he has before him. I know I am not a model man, I have made no pretense to be, but am I that? However, that is the sum of my wrongs. From this point I can edit Cavour with an untroubled mind, for he mentions me no more. It would seem the Selenites who had come upon him carried him to some point in the interior down a great shaft, by means of what he describes as a sort of balloon. We gather from the rather confused passage in which he describes this, and from a number of chance allusions and hints and other and subsequent messages, that this great shaft is one of an enormous system of artificial shafts that run each from what is called a lunar crater, downwards for very nearly a hundred miles towards the central portion of our satellite. These shafts communicate by transverse tunnels. They throw out abysmal caverns and expand into great globular places. The whole of the moon's substance for a hundred miles inward, indeed, is a mere sponge of rock. Partly, says Cavour, this sponginess is natural but very largely it is due to the enormous industry of the Selenites in the past. The enormous circular mounds of the excavated rock and earth it is that form those great circles about the tunnels known to earthly astronomers, misled by a false analogy, as volcanoes. It was down this shaft they took him, in this sort of balloon he speaks of, at first into an inky blackness, and then into a region of continually increasing phosphorescence. Cavour's dispatches show him to be curiously regardless of detail for a scientific man, but we gather that this light was due to the streams and cascades of water, no doubt containing some phosphorescent organism, that flowed ever more abundantly downward towards the central sea. And as he descended, he says, the Selenites also became luminous, and at last far below him he saw, as it were, 
a lake of heatless fire, the waters of the central sea, glowing and eddying in strange perturbation, like luminous blue milk that is just on the boil. This lunar sea, says Cavour in a later passage, is not a stagnant ocean. A solar tide sends it in a perpetual flow around the lunar axis, and strange storms and boilings and rushings of its waters occur, and at times cold winds and thunderings that ascend out of it into the busy ways of the great ant hill above. It is only when the water is in motion that it gives out light. In its rare seasons of calm, it is black. Commonly, when one sees it, its waters rise and fall in an oily swell, and flakes and big rafts of shining, bubbly foam drift with the sluggish, faintly glowing current. The Selenites navigate its cavernous straits and lagoons in little shallow boats of a canoe-like shape. And even before my journey to the galleries about the Grand Lunar, who is master of the moon, I was permitted to make a brief excursion on its waters. The caverns and passages are naturally very tortuous. A large proportion of these ways are known only to expert pilots among the fishermen, and not infrequently Selenites are lost for ever in their labyrinths. In their remoter recesses, I am told, strange creatures lurk, some of them terrible and dangerous creatures that all the science of the moon has been unable to exterminate. There is particularly the Rapha, an inextricable mass of clutching tentacles that one hacks to pieces only to multiply, and the Tsi, a darting creature that is never seen, so subtly and suddenly does it slay. He gives us a gleam of description. I was reminded on this excursion of what I have read of the Mammoth Caves. If only I had had a yellow flambeau instead of the pervading blue light, and a solid-looking boatman with an oar instead of a scuttle-faced selenite working an engine at the back of the canoe, I could have imagined I had suddenly got back to earth. The rocks about us were very various, sometimes black, sometimes pale blue and veined, and once they flashed and glittered as though we had come into a mine of sapphires and below one saw the ghostly phosphorescent fishes flash and vanish in the hardly less phosphorescent deep. Then presently a long ultramarine vista down the turgid stream of one of the channels of traffic, and a landing stage, and then perhaps a glimpse up the enormous crowded shaft of one of the vertical ways. In one great place heavy with glistening stalactites, a number of boats were fishing, we went alongside one of these and watched the long-armed selenites winding in a net. They were little hunchbacked insects, with very strong arms, short bandy legs, and crinkled face masks. As they pulled at it, that net seemed the heaviest thing I had come upon in the moon. It was loaded with weights, no doubt of gold, and it took a long time to draw for in those waters the larger and more edible fish lurk deep. The fish in the net came up like a blue moonrise, a blaze of darting, tossing blue. Among their catch was a many-tenticulate, evil-eyed black thing, ferociously active, whose appearance they greeted with shrieks and twitters, and which with quick, nervous movements they hacked to pieces by means of little hatchets. All its dissevered limbs continued to lash and writhe in a vicious manner. Afterwards, when fever had hold of me, I dreamt again and again of that bitter, furious creature rising so vigorous and active out of the unknown sea. It was the most active and malignant thing of all the living creatures I have yet seen in this world inside the moon. The surface of the sea must be very nearly two hundred miles, if not more, below the level of the moon's exterior. All the cities of the moon lie, I learnt, immediately above the central sea, in such cavernous spaces and artificial galleries as I have described, and they communicate with the exterior by enormous vertical shafts, 
which open invariably in what are called by earthly astronomers the craters of the moon. The lid covering one such aperture I had already seen during the wanderings that had preceded my capture. Upon the condition of the less central portion of the moon I have not yet arrived at very precise knowledge. There is an enormous system of caverns in which the moon calf shelter during the night, and there are abattoirs and the like. In one of these it was that I and Bedford fought with the Selenite butchers, and I have since seen balloons laden with meat descending out of the upper dark. I have as yet scarcely learnt as much of these things as a Zulu in London would learn about the British corn supplies in the same time. It is clear, however, that these vertical shafts and the vegetation of the surface must play an essential role in ventilating and keeping fresh the atmosphere of the moon. At one time, and particularly on my first emergence from my prison, there was certainly a cold wind blowing down the shaft, and later there was a kind of sirocco upward that corresponded with my fever. For at the end of about three weeks I fell ill of an indefinable sort of fever, and in spite of sleep and the quinine tabloids that very fortunately I had brought in my pocket, I remained ill and fretting miserably, almost to the time when I was taken into the presence of the Grand Lunar, who is master of the moon. I will not dilate on the wretchedness of my condition, he remarks, during those days of ill health. And he goes on with great amplitude with details I omit here. My temperature, he concludes, kept abnormally high for a long time, and I lost all desire for food. I had stagnant waking intervals, and sleep tormented by dreams, and at one phase I was, I remember, so weak as to be earth-sick and almost hysterical. I longed almost intolerably for color to break the everlasting blue. He reverts again presently to the topic of this sponge-caught lunar atmosphere. I am told by astronomers and physicists that all he tells is in absolute accordance with what was already known of the moon's condition. Had earthly astronomers had the courage and imagination to push home a bold induction, says Mr. Wendigy, they might have foretold almost everything that Cavour has to say of the general structure of the moon. They know now pretty certainly that moon and earth are not so much satellite and primary, as smaller and greater sisters, made out of one mass, and consequently made of the same material. And since the density of the moon is only three-fifths that of the earth, there can be nothing for it but that she is hollowed out by a great system of caverns, there was no necessity, said Mr. Jabez Flapp, F.R.S., that most entertaining exponent of the facetious side of the stars, that we should ever have gone to the moon to find out such easy inferences, and points the pun with an allusion to Gruyere. But he certainly might have announced his knowledge of the hollowness of the moon before. And if the moon is hollow, then the apparent absence of air and water is, of course, quite easily explained. The sea lies within at the bottom of the caverns, and the air travels through the great sponge of galleries, in accordance with simple physical laws. The caverns of the moon on the whole are very windy places. As the sunlight comes round the moon, the air in the outer galleries on that side is heated, its pressure increases, some flows out on the exterior and mingles with the evaporating air of the craters, where the plants remove its carbonic acid, while the greater portion flows round through the galleries to replace the shrinking air of the cooling side that the sunlight has left. There is, therefore, a constant eastward breeze in the air of the outer galleries, and an upflow during the lunar day up the shafts, complicated, of course, very greatly, by the varying shape of the galleries and the ingenious contrivances of the selenite mind. End of chapter.
Chapter Twenty Four of The First Men in the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The First Men in the Moon by H. G. Wells. Chapter Twenty Four The Natural History of the Selenites. The messages of Cavour from the 6th up to the 16th are for the most part so much broken, and they abound so in repetitions, that they scarcely form a consecutive narrative. They will be given in full, of course, in the scientific report, but here it will be far more convenient to continue simply to abstract and quote as in the former chapter. We have subjected every word to a keen critical scrutiny and my own brief memories and impressions of lunar things have been of inestimable help in interpreting what would otherwise have been impenetrably dark. And, naturally, as living beings, our interest centers far more upon the strange community of lunar insects in which he was living, it would seem, as an honored guest, than upon the mere physical condition of their world. I have already made it clear, I think, that the Selenites I saw resembled man in maintaining the erect attitude and in having four limbs, and I have compared the general appearance of their heads and the jointing of their limbs to that of insects. I have mentioned, too, the peculiar consequence of the smaller gravitation of the moon on their fragile slightness. Cavour confirms me upon all these points. He calls them animals, though of course they fall under no division of the classification of earthly creatures, and he points out the insect type of anatomy had, fortunately for men, never exceeded a relatively very small size on earth. The largest terrestrial insects, living or extinct, do not, as a matter of fact, measure six inches in length. But here, against the lesser gravitation of the moon, a creature certainly as much an insect as vertebrate seems to have been able to attain to human and ultra-human dimensions. He does not mention the ant, but throughout his allusions the ant is continually being brought before my mind, in its sleepless activity, in its intelligence and social organization, in its structure, and more particularly in the fact that it displays, in addition to the two forms, the male and the female form, that almost all other animals possess, a number of other sexless creatures, workers, soldiers, and the like differing from one another in structure, character, power, and use, and yet all members of the same species. For these selenites, also, have a great variety of forms. Of course they are not only colossally greater in size than ants, but also, in Cavour's opinion at least, in intelligence, morality, and social wisdom are they colossally greater than men. And instead of the four or five different forms of ant that are found, there are almost innumerably different forms of selenite. I had endeavored to indicate the very considerable difference observable in such selenites of the outer crust as I happened to encounter. The differences in size and proportions were certainly as wide as the differences between the most widely separated races of men. But such differences as I saw fade absolutely to nothing in comparison with the huge distinctions of which Cavour tells. It would seem the exterior selenites I saw were, indeed, mostly engaged in kindred occupations, moon-calf herds, butchers, fleshers, and the like. But within the moon, practically unsuspected by me, there are, it seems, a number of other sorts of selenite, differing in size, differing in the relative size of part to part, differing in power and appearance, and yet not different species of creatures, but only different forms of one species, and retaining through all their variations a certain common likeness that marks their specific unity. The moon is, indeed, a sort of vast ant hill. only, instead of there being only four or five sorts of ants, there are many hundred different sorts of selenite, and almost every gradation between one sort and another. It would seem the discovery came upon Cavour very speedily. I infer rather than learn from his narrative that he was captured by the moon-calf herds, 
under the direction of these other selenites who have larger brain cases, heads, and very much shorter legs. Finding he would not walk even under the goad, they carried him into darkness, crossed a narrow, plank-like bridge that may have been the identical bridge I had refused, and put him down in something that must have seemed at first to be some sort of lift. This was the balloon. It had certainly been absolutely invisible to us in the darkness, and what had seemed to me a mere plank-walking into the void was really, no doubt, the passage of the gangway. In this he descended towards constantly more luminous caverns of the moon. At first they descended in silence, save for the twitterings of the Salonites, and then into a stir of windy movement. In a little while the profound blackness had made his eyes so sensitive that he began to see more and more of the things about him, and at last the vague took shape. "'Conceive an enormous cylindrical space,' says Cavour in his seventh message, "'a quarter of a mile across, perhaps, very dimly lit at first, and then brighter, with big platforms twisting down its sides in a spiral that vanishes at last below in a blue profundity, and lit even more brightly. One could not tell how or why. Think of the well of the very largest spiral staircase or lift shaft that you have ever looked down, and magnify that by a hundred. Imagine it at twilight seen through blue glass. Imagine yourself looking down that. Only imagine also that you feel extraordinarily light, and have got rid of any giddy feeling you might have on earth, and you will have the first conditions of my impression. Round this enormous shaft imagine a broad gallery running in a much steeper spiral than would be credible on earth, and forming a steep road protected from the gulf only by a little parapet that vanishes at last in perspective a couple of miles below. Looking up, I saw the very fellow of the downward vision. It had, of course, the effect of looking into a very steep cone. A wind was blowing down the shaft, and far above I fancy I heard, growing fainter and fainter, the bellowing of the moon-calves that were being driven down again from their evening pasturage on the exterior. And up and down the spiral galleries were scattered numerous moon-people, pallid, faintly luminous beings, regarding our appearance, or busied on unknown errands. Either I fancied it, or a flake of snow came drifting down on the icy breeze, and then, falling like a snowflake, a little figure, a little man-insect clinging to a parachute, drove down very swiftly towards the central places of the moon. The big-headed selenite sitting beside me, seeing me move my head with the gesture of one who saw, pointed with his trunk-like hand, and indicated a sort of jetty coming into sight very far below, a little landing-stage, as it were, hanging into the void. As it swept up towards us our pace diminished very rapidly, and in a few moments, as it seemed, we were abreast of it, and at rest. A mooring-rope was flung and grasped and I found myself pulled down to a level with a great crowd of selenites who jostled to see me. It was an incredible crowd. Suddenly and violently there was forced upon my attention the vast amount of difference there is amongst these beings of the moon. Indeed, there seemed not two alike in all that jostling multitude. They differed in shape, they differed in size. They rang all the horrible changes on the theme of selenite form. Some bulged and overhung, some ran about among the feet of their fellows. All of them had a grotesque and disquieting suggestion of an insect that is somehow contrived to mock humanity, but all seemed to present an incredible exaggeration of some particular feature. One had a vast right forelimb, an enormous antennal arm, as it were, one seemed all leg, poised, as it were, on stilts. Another protruded the edge of his face-mask into a nose-like organ that made him startlingly human until one saw his expressionless gaping mouth. The strange, and, 
except for the want of mantibles and palps, most insect-like head of the mooncalf minders underwent, indeed, the most incredible transformations. Here it was broad and low, here high and narrow. Here its leathery brow was drawn out into horns and strange features. Here it was whiskered and divided, and there with a grotesquely human profile. One distortion was particularly conspicuous. There were several brain cases distended like bladders to a huge size, with a face mask reduced to quite small proportions. There were several amazing forms, with heads reduced to microscopic proportions and blobby bodies, and fantastic flimsy things that existed, it would seem, only as a basis for vast, trumpet-like protrusions of the lower part of the mask. And oddest of all, as it seemed to me for the moment, two or three of these weird inhabitants of a subterranean world, a world sheltered by innumerable miles of rock from sun or rain, carried umbrellas in their tentaculate hands, real terrestrial-looking umbrellas. And then I thought of the parachutist I had watched descend. These moon people behaved exactly as a human crowd might have done in similar circumstances. They jostled and thrust one another. They shoved one another aside. They even clambered upon one another to get a glimpse of me. Every moment they increased in numbers, and pressed more urgently upon the discs of my ushers. Cavor does not explain what he means by this. Every moment fresh shapes emerged from the shadows and forced themselves upon my astounded attention, and presently I was signed and helped into a sort of litter, and lifted up on the shoulders of strong-armed bearers, and so borne through the twilight over this seething multitude towards the apartments that were provided for me in the moon. All about me were eyes, faces, masks, a leathery noise like the rustling of beetle wings, and a great bleating and cricket-like twittering of selenite voices. We gather he was taken to a hexagonal apartment, and there for a space he was confined. Afterwards he was given a much more considerable liberty, indeed almost as much freedom as one has in a civilized town on earth, and it would appear that the mysterious being who is the ruler and master of the moon appointed two selenites, with large heads, to guard and study him, and to establish whatever mental communications were possible with him. And, amazing and incredible as it may seem, these two creatures, these fantastic men-insects, these beings of other worlds, were presently communicating with Cavour by means of terrestrial speech. Cavour speaks of them as fi -u, and C. Puff. Fi U, he says, was about five feet high. He had small, slender legs about eighteen inches long, and slight feet of the common lunar pattern. On these balanced a little body, throbbing with the pulsations of his heart. He had long, soft, many-jointed arms ending in a tentacled grip, and his neck was many-jointed in the usual way, but exceptionally short and thick. His head, says Cavour, apparently alluding to some previous description that has gone astray in space, is of the common lunar type, but strangely modified. The mouth has the usual expressionless gape, but it is unusually small and pointing downward, and the mask is reduced to the size of a large flat nose-flap. On either side are the little eyes. The rest of the head is distended into a huge globe, and the chitinous leathery cuticle of the mooncalf herds thins out to a mere membrane, through which the pulsating brain movements are distinctly visible. He is a creature, indeed, with a tremendously hypertrophied brain, and with the rest of his organism both relatively and absolutely dwarfed. In another passage Cavour compares the back view of him to Atlas supporting the world. C. Puff, it seems, was a very similar insect, but his face was drawn out to a considerable length, and the brain hypertrophy being in different regions, his head was not round, but pear-shaped, with the stalk downward, 
There were also litter-carriers, lopsided beings with enormous shoulders, very spidery ushers, and a squat foot-attendant in Kivor's retinue. The manner in which Fi U and Si Puff attacked the problem of speech was fairly obvious. They came into this hexagonal cell in which Kavor was confined, and began imitating every sound he made, beginning with a cough. He seems to have grasped their intention with great quickness, and to have begun repeating words to them, and pointing to indicate the application. The procedure was probably always the same. Fi U would attend to Kavor for a space, then point also and say the word he had heard. The first word he mastered was man, and the second Mooney, which Cavour on the spur of the moment seems to have used instead of Selenite for the moon race. As soon as Fi U was assured of the meaning of a word, he repeated it to C. Puff, who remembered it infallibly. They mastered over one hundred English nouns at their first session. Subsequently, it seems, they brought an artist with them to assist the work of explanation with sketches and diagrams, Cavour's drawings being rather crude. He was, says Cavour, a being with an active arm and an arresting eye, and he seemed to draw with incredible swiftness. The eleventh message is undoubtedly only a fragment of a longer communication. After some broken sentences, the record of which is unintelligible, it goes on. But it will interest only linguists, and delay me too long, to give the details of the series of intent parleys of which these were the beginning, and indeed I very much doubt if I could give in anything like the proper order all the twistings and turnings that we made in our pursuit of mutual comprehension. Verbs were soon plain sailing at least such active verbs as I could express by drawings. Some adjectives were easy, but when it came to abstract nouns, to prepositions, and the sort of hackneyed figures of speech, by means of which so much is expressed on earth, it was like diving in cork jackets. Indeed, these difficulties were insurmountable until to the sixth lesson came a fourth assistant, a being with a huge football-shaped head whose forte was clearly the pursuit of intricate analogy. He entered in a preoccupied manner, stumbling against a stool, and the difficulties that arose had to be presented to him with a certain amount of clamour and hitting and pricking before they reached his apprehension. But once he was involved his penetration was amazing. Whenever there came a need of thinking beyond Fi U's by no means limited scope, this prolate-headed person was in request, but he invariably told the conclusion to Tsi Puff in order that it might be remembered. Tsi Puff was ever the arsenal for facts, and so we advanced again. It seemed long, and yet brief, a matter of days, before I was positively talking with these insects of the moon. Of course, at first it was an intercourse infinitely tedious and exasperating, but imperceptibly it has grown to comprehension, and my patience has grown to meet its limitations. Fi U it is who does all the talking. He does it with a vast amount of meditative provisional mm-mms, and has caught up one or two phrases, if I may say, if you understand, and beads all his speech with them. Thus he would discourse. Imagine him explaining his artist. Mm, mm, he, if I may say, draw. Eat little. Drink little. Draw. Love draw. No other thing. Hate all who do not draw like him. Angry. Hate all who draw like him better. Hate most people. Hate all who do not think all world for to draw. Angry. Mm. All things mean nothing to him. Only draw. He like you. If you understand. New thing to draw. Ugly. Striking. Eh? He, turning to see Puff, Love, remember words. Remember wonderful more than any. Think no. Draw no. Remember. Say, 
here he referred to his gifted assistant for a word, "'Histories. All things. He here once, say ever.' It is more wonderful to me than I dreamt that anything ever could be again to hear, in this perpetual obscurity, these extraordinary creatures, for even familiarity fails to weaken the inhuman effect of their appearance, continually piping a nearer approach to coherent earthly speech, asking questions, giving answers. I feel that I am casting back to the fable-hearing period of childhood again when the ant and the grasshopper talked together, and the bee judged between them. And while these linguistic exercises were going on, Cavour seems to have experienced a considerable relaxation of his confinement. The first dread and distrust our unfortunate conflict aroused is being, he said, continually effaced by the deliberate rationality of all I do. I am now able to come and go as I please or I am restricted only for my own good. So it is I have been able to get at this apparatus, and assisted by a happy find among the material that is littered in this enormous store-cave, I have contrived to dispatch these messages. So far not the slightest attempt has been made to interfere with me in this, though I have made it quite clear to fi -U that I am signalling to the earth. You talk to other? he asked, watching me. "'Others,' said I. "'Others,' he said. "'Oh, yes, men?' And I went on transmitting. Cavour was continually making corrections in his previous accounts of the Selenites as fresh facts flowed upon him to modify his conclusions, and accordingly one gives the quotations that follow with a certain amount of reservation. They are quoted from the ninth thirteenth and sixteenth messages, and, altogether vague and fragmentary as they are, they probably give as complete a picture of the social life of this strange community as mankind can now hope to have for many generations. "'In the moon,' says Cavour, "'every citizen knows his place. He is born to that place, and the elaborate discipline of training and education and surgery he undergoes fits him at last so completely to it that he has neither ideas nor organs for any purpose beyond it. Why should he? fi -O would ask. If, for example, a Selenite is destined to be a mathematician, his teachers and trainers set out at once to that end. They check any incipient disposition to other pursuits. They encourage his mathematical bias with a perfect psychological skill his brain grows, or at least the mathematical faculties of his brain grows, and the rest of him only so much as is necessary to sustain this essential part of him. At last, save for rest and food, his one delight lies in the exercise and display of his faculty, his one interest in its application, his sole society with other specialists in his own line. His brain grows continually larger, at least so far as the portions engaging in mathematics are concerned. They bulge ever larger and seem to suck all life and vigor from the rest of his frame. His limbs shrivel, his heart and digestive organs diminish, his insect face is hidden under its bulging contours. His voice becomes a mere stridulation for the stating of formula. He seems deaf to all but properly enunciated problems. The faculty of laughter, save for the sudden discovery of some paradox, is lost to him. His deepest emotion is the evolution of a novel computation, and so he attains his end. Or, again, a Selenite appointed to be a minder of moon-calves is from his earliest years induced to think and live moon-calf, to find his pleasure in moon-calf lore his exercise in their tending and pursuit. He is trained to become wiry and active. His eye is indurated to the tight wrappings, the angular contours that constitute a smart mooncalfishness. He takes at last no interest in the deeper part of the moon. He regards all selenites not equally versed in mooncalves with indifference, derision, or hostility. 
his thoughts are of mooncalf pastures, and his dialect an accomplished mooncalf technique. So also he loves his work, and discharges in perfect happiness the duty that justifies his being. And so it is with all sorts and conditions of selenites, each is a perfect unit in a world machine. These beings with big heads, on whom the intellectual labors fall, form a sort of aristocracy in this strange society, and at the head of them, quintessential of the moon, is that marvellous gigantic ganglion, the Grand Lunar, into whose presence I am finally to come. The unlimited development of the minds of the intellectual class is rendered possible by the absence of any bony skull in the lunar anatomy, that strange box of bone that clamps about the developing brain of man, imperiously insisting, thus far and no farther, to all his possibilities. They fall into three main classes, differing greatly in influence and respect. There are administrators, of whom phi -u is one, selenites of considerable initiative and versatility, responsible each for a certain cubic content of the moon's bulk. The experts, like the football-headed thinker, who are trained to perform certain special operations, and the erudite, who are the repositories of all knowledge. To the latter class belongs Tsi Puff the first lunar professor of terrestrial languages. With regard to these latter, it is a curious little thing to note that the unlimited growth of the lunar brain has rendered unnecessary the invention of all those mechanical aids to brain work which have distinguished the career of man. There are no books, no records of any sort, no libraries or inscriptions. All knowledge is stored in distended brains such as the honey ants of Texas store honey in their distended abdomens. The lunar Somerset House and the lunar British Museum Library are collections of living brains. The less specialized administrators, I note, do for the most part take a very lively interest in me whenever they encounter me. They will come out of the way and stare at me, and ask questions to which Fee-U will reply. I see them going hither and thither with a retinue of bearers, attendants, shouters, parachute carriers, and so forth. Queer groups to see. The experts, for the most part, ignore me completely, even as they ignore each other, or notice me only to begin a clamorous exhibition of their distinctive skill. The erudite, for the most part, are wrapped in an impervious and apoplectic complacency from which only a denial of their erudition can rouse them. Usually they are led about by little watchers and attendants, and often there are small and active-looking creatures, small females usually, that I am inclined to think are a sort of wife to them. But some of the profounder scholars are altogether too great for locomotion, and are carried from place to place in a sort of sedan tub, wobbling jellies of knowledge that enlist my respectful astonishment. I have just passed one in coming to this place where I am permitted to amuse myself with these electrical toys, a vast, shaven, shaky head, bald and thin-skinned, carried on his grotesque stretcher. In front and behind came his bearers, and curious, almost trumpet-faced, news disseminators shrieked his fame. I have already mentioned the retinues that accompany most of the intellectuals, ushers, bearers, valets, extraneous tentacles and muscles, as it were, to replace the abortive physical powers of these hypertrophied minds. Porters almost invariably accompany them. There are also extremely swift messengers with spider-like legs and hands for grasping parachutes and attendants with vocal organs that could well-nigh wake the dead. Apart from their controlling intelligence, these subordinates are as inert and helpless as umbrellas in a stand. They exist only in relation to the orders they have to obey, the duties they have to perform. The bulk of these insects, however, who go to and fro upon the spiral ways, who fill the ascending balloons, 
and dropped past me clinging to flimsy parachutes are, I gathered, of the operative class. Machine hands, indeed, some of these are in actual nature. It is not a figure of speech. The single tentacle of the moon-calf herd is profoundly modified for clawing, lifting, guiding, the rest of them no more than necessary subordinate appendages to these important mechanisms, have enormously developed auditory organs, some whose work lies in delicate chemical operations project a vast olfactory organ. Others again have flat feet for treadles with ankylosed joints, and others, who I have been told are glass-blowers, seem mere lung-bellows. But every one of these common selenites I have seen at work is exquisitely adapted to the social need it meets. Fine work is done by fined-down workers, amazingly dwarfed and neat. Some I could hold in the palm of my hand. There is even a sort of turnspit selenite, very common, whose duty and only delight is to apply the motive power for various small appliances and to rule over these things and order any erring tendency there might be in some aberrant natures are the most muscular beings i have seen in the moon a sort of lunar police who must have been trained from their earliest years to give a perfect respect and obedience to the swollen heads the making of these various sorts of operative must be a very curious and interesting process. I am very much in the dark about it, but quite recently I came upon a number of young selenites confined in jars from which only the four limbs protruded, who were being compressed to become machine-minders of a special sort. The extended hand in this highly developed system of technical education is stimulated by irritants and nourished by injection, while the rest of the body is starved. Fi-U, unless I misunderstood him, explained that in the earliest stages these queer little creatures are apt to display signs of suffering in their various cramped situations, but they easily become indurated to their lot, and he took me on to where a number of flexible-minded messengers were being drawn out and broken in. It is quite unreasonable, I know, but such glimpses of the educational methods of these beings affect me disagreeably. I hope, however, that may pass off, and I may be able to see more of this aspect of their wonderful social order. That wretched-looking hand-tentacle sticking out of its jar seemed to have a sort of limp appeal for lost possibilities. It haunts me still, although of course it really is in the end a far more humane proceeding than our earthly method of leaving children to grow into human beings and then making machines of them quite recently too i think it was on the eleventh or twelfth visit i made to this apparatus i had a curious light upon the lives of these operatives i was being guided through a short cut hither instead of going down the spiral and by the keys to the central sea. From the devious windings of a long, dark gallery we emerged into a vast, low cavern, pervaded by an earthy smell, and as things go in this darkness, rather brightly lit. The light came from a tumultuous growth of livid fungoid shapes, some indeed singularly like our terrestrial mushrooms, but standing as high or higher than a man. "'Moonies eat these?' said I to Fi-U. "'Yes, fond.' "'Goodness me!' I cried. "'What's that?' My eye had just caught the figure of an exceptionally big and ungainly selenite lying motionless among the stems, face downward. We stopped. "'Dead?' I asked. For as yet I had seen no dead in the moon, and I have grown curious. "'No!' exclaimed Fiu. Him, worker. No work to do. Get little drink, then. Make sleep. Till we him want. What good him wake, eh? No want him walking about. There's another, cried I. And indeed all that huge extent of mushroom ground was, I found, peppered with these prostrate figures sleeping under an opiate until the moon had need of them.
There were scores of them of all sorts, and we were able to turn over some of them, and examine them more precisely than I had been able to previously. They breathed noisily at my doing so, but did not wake. One I remember very distinctly. He left a strong impression, I think, because some trick of the light and of his attitude was strongly suggestive of a drawn-up human figure. His forelimbs were long, delicate tentacles. He was some kind of refined manipulator, and the pose of his slumber suggested a submissive suffering. No doubt it was a mistake for me to interpret his expression in that way, but I did. And as Fiu rolled him over into the darkness among the livid fleshiness again, I felt a distinctly unpleasant sensation, although as he rolled the insect in him was confessed. It simply illustrates the unthinking way in which one acquires habits of feeling. To drug the worker one does not want, and toss him aside is surely far better than to expel him from his factory, to wander starving in the streets. In every complicated social community there is necessarily a certain intermittency of employment for all specialized labor, and in this way the trouble of an unemployed problem is altogether anticipated. And yet, so unreasonable are even scientifically trained minds, I still do not like the memory of those prostrate forms amidst those quiet, luminous arcades of fleshy growth, and I avoid that shortcut in spite of the inconveniences of the longer, more noisy, and more crowded alternative. My alternative route takes me round by a huge shadowy cavern, very crowded and clamorous, and here it is I see peering out of the hexagonal openings of a sort of honeycomb wall, or parading a large open space behind, or selecting the toys and amulets made to please them by the dainty tentacled jewellers who work in kennels below, the mothers of the moon world, the queen bees, as it were, of the hive. They are noble-looking beings, fantastically and sometimes quite beautifully adorned, with a proud carriage, and, save for their mouths, almost microscopic heads. Of the condition of the moon sexes, marrying and giving in marriage, and of birth and so forth among the Selenites, I have as yet been able to learn very little. With the steady progress of Fi U in English, however, my ignorance will no doubt as steadily disappear. I am of opinion that, as with the ants and bees, there is a large majority of the members in this community of the neuter sex. Of course on earth in our cities there are now many who never live that life of parentage which is the natural life of man. Here, as with the ants, this thing has become a normal condition of the race, and the whole of such replacement as is necessary falls upon this special and by no means numerous class of matrons, the mothers of the moon world, large and stately beings beautifully fitted to bear the larval selenite. Unless I misunderstand an explanation of fi -us, they are as absolutely incapable of cherishing the young they bring into the moon. Periods of foolish indulgence alternate with moods of aggressive violence, and as soon as possible the little creatures, who are quite soft and flabby and pale-coloured, are transferred to the charge of celibate females, woman workers, as it were, who in some cases possess brains of almost masculine dimensions. Just at this point, unhappily, this message broke off. Fragmentary and tantalising as the matter constituting this chapter is, it does nevertheless give a vague, broad impression of an altogether strange and wonderful world, a world with which our own may have to reckon we know not how speedily. This intermittent trickle of messages, this whispering of a record-needle in the stillness of the mountain slopes, is the first warning of such a change in human conditions as mankind has scarcely imagined heretofore. In that satellite of ours there are new elements, new appliances, traditions, an overwhelming avalanche of new ideas, 
a strange race with whom we must inevitably struggle for mastery. Gold as common as iron or wood. End of chapter. Chapter 25 of The First Men in the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The First Men in the Moon by H. G. Wells. Chapter 25 The Grand Lunar. The penultimate message describes, with occasionally elaborate detail, the encounter between Cavour and the Grand Lunar, who is the ruler or master of the moon. Cavour seems to have sent most of it without interference, but to have been interrupted in the concluding portion. The second came after an interval of a week. The first message begins, At last I am able to resume this. It then becomes illegible for a space, and after a time resumed in mid-sentence. The missing words of the following sentence are probably the crowd. There follows quite clearly, Grew ever denser as we drew near the palace of the Grand Lunar, if I may call a series of excavations a palace. Everywhere faces stared at me, blank chitinous gapes and masks, eyes peering over tremendous olfactory developments, eyes beneath monstrous forehead plates, an undergrowth of smaller creatures dodged and yelped, and helmet faces poised on sinuous long-jointed necks appeared craning over shoulders and beneath armpits. Keeping a welcome space about me marched a cordon of stolid, scuttle-headed guards, who had joined us on our leaving the boat in which we had come along the channels of the Central Sea. The quick-eyed artist with a little brain joined us also, and a thick bunch of lean porter insects swayed and struggled under the multitude of conveniences that were considered essential to my state. I was carried in a litter during the final stage of our journey. This litter was made of some very ductile metal that looked dark to me, meshed and woven, and with bars of paler metal, and about me as I advanced there grouped itself a long and complicated procession. In front, after the manner of heralds, marched four trumpet-faced creatures making a devastating bray, and then came squat, resolute moving ushers before and behind, and on either hand a gallery of learned heads, a sort of animated encyclopedia, who were, Fi-U explained, to stand about the Grand Lunar for purposes of reference. Not a thing in lunar science, not a point of view or method of thinking, that these wonderful beings did not carry in their heads. Followed guards and porters, and then Fi-U's shivering brain borne also on a litter. Then came C-Puff in a slightly less important litter, then myself on a litter of greater elegance than any other, and surrounded by my food and drink attendants. More trumpeters came next, splitting the ear with vehement outcries, and then several big brains, special correspondents one might well call them, or historiographers, charged with the task of observing and remembering every detail of this epic-making interview. A company of attendants, bearing and dragging banners and masses of scented fungus and curious symbols, vanished in the darkness behind. The way was lined by ushers and officers in caparisons that gleamed like steel, and beyond their line, so far as my eyes could pierce the gloom, the heads of that enormous crowd extended. I will own that I am still by no means indurated to the peculiar effect of the selenite appearance and to find myself, as it were, adrift on this broad sea of excited entomology was by no means agreeable. Just for a space I had something very like what I should imagine people mean when they speak of the horrors. It had come to me before in these lunar caverns, 
when on occasion I have found myself weaponless and with an undefended back, amidst a crowd of these selenites, but never quite so vividly. It is, of course, as absolutely irrational a feeling as one could well have, and I hope gradually to subdue it. But just for a moment, as I swept forward into the welter of the vast crowd, it was only by gripping my litter tightly and summoning all my willpower that I succeeded in avoiding an outcry or some such manifestation. It lasted perhaps three minutes, then I had myself in hand again. We ascended the spiral of a vertical way for some time, and then passed through a series of huge halls, dome-roofed and elaborately decorated. The approach to the Grand Lunar was certainly contrived to give one a vivid impression of his greatness. Each cavern one entered seemed greater and more boldly arched than its predecessor. This effect of progressive size was enhanced by a thin haze of faintly luminescent blue incense that thickened as one advanced, and robbed even the nearer figures of clearness. I seemed to advance continually to something larger, dimmer, and less material. I must confess that all this multitude made me feel extremely shabby and unworthy. I was unshaven and unkempt. I had brought no razor. I had a coarse beard over my mouth. On earth I have always been inclined to despise any attention to my person beyond a proper care for cleanliness. But under the exceptional circumstances in which I found myself, representing, as I did, my planet and my kind, and depending very largely upon the attractiveness of my appearance for a proper reception, I could have given much for something a little more artistic and dignified than the husks I wore. I had been so serene in the belief that the moon was uninhabited as to overlook such precautions altogether. As it was, I was dressed in a flannel jacket, knickerbockers, and golfing stockings, stained with every sort of dirt the moon offered, slippers, of which the left heel was wanting, and a blanket, through a hole in which I thrust my head. These clothes, indeed, I still wear. Sharp bristles are anything but an improvement to my cast of features, and there was an unmended tear at the knee of my knickerbockers that showed conspicuously as I squatted in my litter. My right stocking, too, persisted in getting about my ankle. I am fully alive to the injustice my appearance did humanity, and if by any expedient I could have improvised something a little out of the way and imposing, I would have done so. But I could hit upon nothing. I did what I could with my blanket, folding it somewhat after the fashion of a toga, and for the rest I sat as upright as the swaying of my litter permitted. Imagine the largest hall you have ever been in, imperfectly lit with blue light and obscured by a grey-blue fog, surging with metallic or vivid grey creatures of such a mad diversity as I have hinted. Imagine this hall to end in an open archway beyond which is a still larger hall, and beyond this yet another and still larger one, and so on. At the end of the vista, dimly seen, a flight of steps, like the steps of Aracoli at Rome, ascend out of sight. Higher and higher these steps appear to go as one draws nearer their base. But at last I came under a huge archway, and beheld the summit of these steps, and upon it the Grand Lunar exalted on his throne. He was seated in what was relatively a blaze of incandescent blue. This and the darkness about him gave him an effect of floating in a blue-black void. He seemed a small, self-luminous cloud at first, brooding on his somber throne. His brain-case must have measured many yards in diameter. For some reason that I cannot fathom, a number of blue searchlights radiated from behind the throne on which he sat, and immediately encircling him was a halo. About him and little and indistinct in this glow, a number of body-servants sustained and supported him, and overshadowed and standing in a huge semicircle beneath him were his intellectual subordinates. 
his remembrancers and computators and searchers and servants, and all the distinguished insects of the court of the moon. Still lower stood ushers and messengers, and then all down the countless steps of the throne were guards, and at the base enormous, various, indistinct, vanishing at last into an absolute black, a vast swaying multitude of the minor dignitaries of the moon. Their feet made a perpetual scraping whisper on the rocky floor, as their limbs moved with a rustling murmur. As I entered the penultimate hall, the music rose and expanded into an imperial magnificence of sound, and the shrieks of the news-bearers died away. I entered the last and greatest hall. My procession opened out like a fan. My ushers and guards went right and left, and the three litters bearing myself and fi -u and Tsi-Puff marched across a shiny darkness of floor to the foot of the giant stairs. Then began a vast throbbing hum that mingled with the music. The two selenites dismounted, but I was bidden remain seated, I imagine as a special honour. The music ceased, but not that humming, and by a simultaneous movement of ten thousand respectful heads, my attention was directed to the inhaled supreme intelligence that hovered above me. At first, as I peered into the radiating glow, this quintessential brain looked very much like an opaque, featureless bladder with dim, undulating ghosts of convolutions writhing visibly within. Then beneath its enormity, and just above the edge of the throne, one saw with a start minute elfin eyes peering out of the glow. No face, but eyes, as if they peered through holes. At first I could see no more than these two staring little eyes, and then below I distinguished the little dwarfed body and its insect-jointed limbs shriveled in white. The eyes stared down at me with a strange intensity, and the lower part of the swollen globe was wrinkled. Ineffectual-looking little hand-tentacles steadied this shape on the throne. It was great. It was pitiful. One forgot the hall and the crowd. I ascended the staircase by jerks. It seemed to me that this darkly glowing brain-case above us spread over me, and took more and more of the whole effect into itself as I drew nearer. The tiers of attendants and helpers grouped about their master seemed to dwindle and fade into the night. I saw that shadowy attendants were busy spraying that great brain with a cooling spray, and patting and sustaining it. For my own part, I sat gripping my swaying litter and staring at the grand lunar unable to turn my gaze aside. And at last, as I reached a little landing that was separated only by ten steps or so from the supreme seat, the woven splendour of the music reached a climax, and ceased, and I was left naked, as it were, in that vastness, beneath the still scrutiny of the Grand Lunar's eyes. He was scrutinising the first man he had ever seen. My eyes dropped at last from his greatness to the ant figures in the blue mist about him, and then down the steps to the massed selenites, still and expectant in their thousands, packed on the floor below. Once again an unreasonable horror reached out towards me, and passed. After the pause came the salutation. I was assisted from my litter and stood awkwardly while a number of curious and no doubt deeply symbolical gestures were vicariously performed for me by two slender officials. The encyclopedic galaxy of the learned that had accompanied me to the entrance of the last hall appeared two steps above me and left and right of me, in readiness for the Grand Lunar's need, and fi -U's pale brain placed itself about halfway up to the throne in such a position as to communicate easily between us without turning his back on either the Grand Lunar or myself. Tsi Puff took up position behind him. Dexterous ushers sidled sideways towards me, keeping a full face to the presence 
I seated myself Turkish fashion, and Fiu and Si Puff also knelt down above me. There came a pause. The eyes of the nearer court went from me to the Grand Lunar and came back to me, and a hissing and piping of expectation passed across the hidden multitudes below, and ceased. That humming ceased. For the first and last time in my experience, the moon was silent. I became aware of a faint, wheezy noise. The Grand Lunar was addressing me. It was like the rubbing of a finger upon a pane of glass. I watched him attentively for a time, and then glanced at the alert Fiu. I felt amidst these slender beings ridiculously thick and fleshy and solid, my head all jaw and black hair. My eyes went back to the Grand Lunar. He had ceased, his attendants were busy, and his shining superfices were glistening and running with cooling spray. Fi-U meditated through an interval. He consulted Si Puff. Then he began piping his recognizable English, at first a little nervously, so that he was not very clear. Mm, the Grand Lunar, wish to say, wishes to say, he gathers you are, mm, men, that you are a man from the planet Earth. He wishes to say that he welcomes you welcomes you, and wishes to learn, learn, if I may use the word, the state of your world, and the reason why you came to this. He paused. I was about to reply when he resumed. He proceeded to remarks of which the drift was not very clear, although I am inclined to think they were intended to be complimentary. He told me that the earth was to the moon what the sun is to the earth and that the Selenites desired very greatly to learn about the earth and men. He then told me, no doubt in compliment also, the relative magnitude and diameter of earth and moon, and the perpetual wonder and speculation with which the Selenites had regarded our planet. I meditated with downcast eyes, and decided to reply that men too had wondered what might lie in the moon, and had judged it dead little reckoning of such magnificence as I had seen that day. The Grand Lunar, in token of recognition, caused his long blue rays to rotate in a very confusing manner, and all about the great hall ran the pipings and whisperings and rustlings of the report of what I had said. He then proceeded to put to Fiu a number of inquiries which were easier to answer. He understood, he explained, that we lived on the surface of the earth, that our air and sea were outside the globe. The latter part, indeed, he already knew from his astronomical specialists. He was very anxious to have more detailed information of what he called this extraordinary state of affairs, for from the solidity of the earth there had always been a disposition to regard it as uninhabitable. He endeavoured first to ascertain the extremes of temperature, to which we earth-beings were exposed, and he was deeply interested by my descriptive treatment of clouds and rain. His imagination was assisted by the fact that the lunar atmosphere in the outer galleries of the night side is not infrequently very foggy. He seemed inclined to marvel that we did not find the sunlight too intense for our eyes, and was interested in my attempt to explain that the sky was tempered to a bluish color through the refraction of the air, though I doubt if he clearly understood that. I explained how the iris of the human eyes can contract the pupil and save the delicate internal structure from the excess of sunlight, and was allowed to approach within a few feet of the presence in order that this structure might be seen. This led to a comparison of the lunar and terrestrial eyes. The former is not only excessively sensitive to such light as men can see, but it can also see heat, and every difference in temperature within the moon renders objects visible to it. The iris was quite a new organ to the Grand Lunar. For a time he amused himself by flashing his rays into my face and watching my pupils contract. 
as a consequence I was dazzled and blinded for some little time. But in spite of that discomfort I found something reassuring by insensible degrees in the rationality of this business of question and answer. I could shut my eyes, think of my answer, and almost forget that the Grand Lunar has no face. When I had descended again to my proper place, the Grand Lunar asked how we sheltered ourselves from heat and storms, and I expounded to him the arts of building and furnishing. Here we wandered into misunderstandings and cross-purposes, due largely, I must admit, to the looseness of my expressions. For a long time I had great difficulty in making him understand the nature of a house. To him and his attendant Selenites it seemed, no doubt, the most whimsical thing in the world that men should build houses when they might descend into excavations and an additional complication was introduced by the attempt I made to explain that men had originally begun their homes in caves, and that they were now taking their railways and many establishments beneath the surface. Here I think a desire for intellectual completeness betrayed me. There was also a considerable tangle due to an equally unwise attempt on my part to explain about mines. Dismissing this topic at last in an incomplete state, the Grand Lunar inquired what we did with the interior of our globe. A tide of twittering and piping swept into the remotest corners of that great assembly when it was at last made clear that we men know absolutely nothing of the contents of the world upon which the immemorial generations of our ancestors had been evolved. Three times had I to repeat that of all the four thousand miles of distance between the earth and its centre, men knew only to the depth of a mile, and that very vaguely. I understood the Grand Lunar to ask why had I come to the moon, seeing we had scarcely touched our own planet yet, but he did not trouble me at that time to proceed to an explanation being too anxious to pursue the details of this mad inversion of all his ideas. He reverted to the question of weather, and I tried to describe the perpetually changing sky, and snow, and frost, and hurricanes. But when the night comes, he asked, is it not cold? I told him it was colder than by day. And does not your atmosphere freeze? I told him not that it was never cold enough for that, because our nights were so short. Not even liquefy? I was about to say no, but then it occurred to me that one part at least of our atmosphere, the water vapour of it, does sometimes liquefy and form dew, and sometimes freezes and forms frost, a process perfectly analogous to the freezing of all the external atmosphere of the moon during its longer night. I made myself clear on this point, and from that the Grand Lunar went on to speak with me of sleep. For the need of sleep that comes so regularly every twenty-four hours to all things is part also of our earthly inheritance. On the moon they rest only at rare intervals, and after exceptional exertions. Then I tried to describe to him the soft splendours of a summer night and from that I passed to a description of those animals that prowl by night and sleep by day. I told him of lions and tigers, and here it seemed as though we had come to a deadlock, for, save in their waters, there are no creatures in the moon not absolutely domestic and subject to his will, and so it has been for immemorial years. They have monstrous water-creatures, but no evil beasts and the idea of anything strong and large existing outside in the night is very difficult for them. The record here is too broken to transcribe for the space of perhaps twenty words or more. He talked with his attendants, as I suppose, upon the strange superficiality and unreasonableness of man who lives on the mere surface of a world, a creature of waves and winds, and all the chances of space, who cannot even unite to overcome the beasts that prey upon his kind, and yet who dares to invade another planet. 
During this aside I sat thinking, and then at his desire I told him of the different sorts of men. He searched me with questions. And for all sorts of work you have the same sort of men. But who thinks? Who governs? I gave him an outline of the democratic method. When I had done, he ordered cooling sprays upon his brow, and then requested me to repeat my explanation, conceiving something had miscarried. "'Do they not do different things, then?' said Fiu. Some, I admitted, were thinkers, and some officials. Some hunted, some were mechanics, some artists, some toilers. "'But all rule,' I said." and have they not different shapes to fit them to their different duties? None that you can see, I said, except perhaps for clothes. Their minds perhaps differ a little, I reflected. Their minds must differ a great deal, said the Grand Lunar, or they would all want to do the same things. In order to bring myself into a closer harmony with his preconceptions, I said that his surmise was right. It was all hidden in the brain, I said, but the difference was there. Perhaps if one could see the minds and souls of men, they would be as varied and unequal as the Selenites. There were great men and small men, men who could reach out far and wide, men who could go swiftly, noisy, trumpet-minded men, and men who could remember without thinking. The record is indistinct for three words. He interrupted me to recall me to my previous statements. But you said all men rule? he pressed. To a certain extent, I said, and made, I fear, a denser fog with my explanation. He reached out to a salient fact. Do you mean, asked he, that there is no grand earthly? I thought of several people but assured him finally there was none. I explained that such autocrats and emperors as we had tried upon earth had usually ended in drink or vice or violence, and that the large and influential section of the people of the earth to which I belonged, the Anglo-Saxons, did not mean to try that sort of thing again, at which the Grand Lunar was even more amazed. But how do you keep even such wisdom as you have? he asked, and I explained to him the way we helped our limited, a word omitted here, probably brains, with libraries of books. I explained to him how our science was growing by the united labors of innumerable little men, and on that he made no comment save that it was evident we had mastered much, in spite of our social savagery, or we could not have come to the moon. Yet the contrast was very marked. With knowledge the Selenites grew and changed. Mankind stored their knowledge about them, and remained brutes equipped. He said this. Here there is a short piece of the record indistinct. He then caused me to describe how we went about this earth of ours, and I described to him our railways and ships. For a time he could not understand that we had had the use of steam only one hundred years, but when he did he was clearly amazed. I may mention as a singular thing that the Selenites use ears to count by, just as we do on earth, though I can make nothing of their numerical system. That, however, does not matter, because phi -u understands ours. From that I went on to tell him that mankind had dwelt in cities only for nine or ten thousand years, and that we were still not united in one brotherhood, but under many different forms of government. This astonished the Grand Lunar very much, when it was made clear to him. At first he thought we referred merely to administrative areas. Our states and empires are still the rawest sketches of what order will some day be, I said, and so I came to tell him. At this point a length of record that probably represents thirty or forty words is totally illegible. The Grand Lunar was greatly impressed by the folly of men in clinging to the inconvenience of diverse tongues, 
They want to communicate, and yet not to communicate, he said, and then for a long time he questioned me closely concerning war. He was at first perplexed and incredulous. You mean to say, he asked, seeking confirmation, that you run about over the surface of your world, this world whose riches you have scarcely begun to scrape, killing one another for beasts to eat? I told him that was perfectly correct. He asked for particulars to assist his imagination. But do not ships and your poor little cities get injured? he asked. And I found the waste of property and conveniences seemed to impress him almost as much as the killing. Tell me more, said the Grand Lunar. Make me see pictures. I cannot conceive these things. And so for a space, though somewhat loath, I told him the story of earthly war. I told him of the first orders and ceremonies of war, of warnings and ultimatums, and the marshalling and marching of troops. I gave him an idea of maneuvers and positions, and battle joined. I told him of sieges and assaults, of starvation and hardship in trenches, and of sentinels freezing in the snow. I told him of routs and surprises, and desperate last stands, and faint hopes, and the pitiless pursuit of fugitives, and the dead upon the field. I told, too, of the past, of invasions and massacres, of the Huns and Tartars, and the wars of Mohammed and the Caliphs, and of the Crusades. And as I went on, and fi -u translated, and the Selenites cooed and murmured in a steadily intensified emotion. I told them an ironclad could fire a shot of a ton twelve miles, and go through twenty feet of iron, and how we could steer torpedoes under water. I went on to describe a Maxim gun in action, and what I could imagine of the Battle of Colenso. The Grand Lunar was so incredulous that he interrupted the translation of what I had said in order to have my verification of my account. They particularly doubted my description of the men cheering and rejoicing as they went into battle. "'But surely they do not like it,' translated fi -u. I assured them men of my race considered battle the most glorious experience of life, at which the whole assembly was stricken with amazement. "'But what good is this war?' asked the Grand Lunar, sticking to his theme. "'Oh, as for good,' said I, "'it thins the population.' "'But why should there be a need?' There came a pause. The cooling sprays impinged upon his brow and then he spoke again. At this point a series of undulations that had been apparent as a perplexing complication as far back as Cavour's description of the silence that fell before the first speaking of the Grand Lunar, became confusingly predominant in the record. These undulations are evidently the result of radiations proceeding from a lunar source, and their persistent approximation to the alternating signals of Cavour is curiously suggestive of some operator deliberately seeking to mix them in with his message and render it illegible. At first they are small and regular, so that with a little care and the loss of very few words we have been able to disentangle Cavour's message. Then they become broad and larger, then suddenly they are irregular, with an irregularity that gives the effect at last of someone scribbling through a line of writing. For a long time nothing can be made of this madly zigzagging trace, then quite abruptly the interruption ceases, leaves a few words clear, and then resumes and continues for the rest of the message, completely obliterating whatever Cavour was attempting to transmit. Why, if this is indeed a deliberate intervention, the Selenites should have preferred to let Cavour go on transmitting his message in happy ignorance of their obliteration of its record, when it was clearly quite in their power and much more easy and convenient for them to stop his proceedings at any time, is a problem to which I can contribute nothing. The thing seems to have happened so, and that is all I can say. <laughs>
This last rag of his description of the Grand Lunar begins in mid-sentence. Interrogated me very closely upon my secret. I was able in a little while to get to an understanding with them, and at last to elucidate what had been a puzzle to me ever since I realized the vastness of their science, namely, how it is they themselves have never discovered Caverite. I find they know of it as a theoretical substance, but they have always regarded it as a practical impossibility, because for some reason there is no helium in the moon, and helium across the last letters of helium slashes the resumption of that obliterating trace. Note that word secret. For that and that alone I base my interpretation of the message that follows, the last message, as both Mr. Wendigee and myself now believe it to be, that he is ever likely to send us. End of chapter Chapter 26, the final chapter of The First Men in the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The First Men in the Moon by H. G. Wells. Chapter 26. THE LAST MESSAGE Cavour SENT TO THE EARTH On this unsatisfactory manner the penultimate message of Cavour dies out. One seems to see him away there in the blue obscurity amidst his apparatus, intently signalling us to the last, all unaware of the curtain of confusion that drops between us, all unaware, too, of the final dangers that even then must have been creeping upon him. His disastrous want of vulgar common sense had utterly betrayed him. He had talked of war. He had talked of all the strength and irrational violence of men, of their insatiable aggressions, their tireless futility of conflict. He had filled the whole moon world with this impression of our race, and then I think it is plain that he made the most fatal admission that upon himself alone hung the possibility, at least for a long time, of any further men reaching the moon. The line the cold, inhuman reason of the moon would take seems plain enough to me, and a suspicion of it, and then perhaps some sudden sharp realization of it, must have come to him. One imagines him about the moon with the remorse of this fatal indiscretion growing in his mind. During a certain time I am inclined to guess the Grand Lunar was deliberating the new situation, and for all that time Cavour may have gone as free as ever he had gone. But obstacles of some sort prevented his getting to his electromagnetic apparatus again after that message I have just given. For some days we received nothing. Perhaps he was having fresh audiences, and trying to evade his previous admissions. Who can hope to guess? And then suddenly, like a cry in the night, like a cry that is followed by a stillness, came the last message. It is the briefest fragment, the broken beginnings of two sentences. The first was, I was mad to let the Grand Lunar know. There was an interval of perhaps a minute. One imagines some interruption from without. A departure from the instrument, a dreadful hesitation among the looming masses of apparatus in that dim, blue-lit cavern, a sudden rush back to it, full of a resolve that came too late, then, as if it were hastily transmitted, came, Caverite made as follows, take... There followed one word, a quite unmeaning word as it stands, U-L-E-S-S. -S. And that is all. It may be he made a hasty attempt to spell useless when his fate was close upon him. Whatever it was that was happening about that apparatus we cannot tell. Whatever it was we shall never, I know, receive another message from the moon. For my own part a vivid dream has come to my help, and I see, almost as plainly as though I had seen it in actual fact, 
a blue-lit, shadowy, disheveled Cavour, struggling in the grip of these insect selenites, struggling ever more desperately and hopelessly as they press upon him, shouting, expostulating, perhaps even at last fighting, and being forced backwards, step by step, out of all speech or sign of his fellows, for evermore into the unknown, into the dark, into that silence that has no end. End of chapter, end of book.